I'm Andrew Graham Dixon, and I'm an art historian. It's one of the top five most beautiful paintings in the world. I'm Giorgio Lucatelli, and I'm a chef. When you say, and made, <laughs> it's what it means. We're both passionate about my homeland, Italy. It is so, so beautiful. The rich flavors and classic dishes of this land are in my culinary DNA. I wouldn't mind being a pig if I had to grow up here. And this country's rich layers of art and history have captivated me since childhood. Primitive, but actually fantastic, beautiful, sophisticated. In this series, we'll be traveling all the way up the east coast of the country, from the deep south to the extreme north, stepping off the tourist track wherever we go. Not a bad spot, is it? This is a dream. I want to show off some of my country's more surprising food, often most born out of necessity, but leaving a legacy that's still shaping Italian modern cuisine around the world. It's better than an oyster. Much better than an oyster. And the art, too, is extraordinary, exotic and deeply rooted in history. We began in the deep south and we'll finish up in the far north, in the Veneto. But on this leg of our journey, we'll be unpacking two regions in the very middle, Le Marche and Umbria home to some of the most captivating Renaissance art in all of Italy. And try its delicious natural flavors as we travel into the heart of Italy. We start in Le Marche, a region that rolls from the Apennine Mountains, the backbone of Italy, down to the Adriatic coast. We're going to begin in a place that I love, Urbino, the town that gave us the painter Raphael and the architect Bramante, who created St. Peter's in Rome. It's a little Renaissance gem of a town. So this, this stand seems to have caught your eye. What, what is this? This is what I wanted to show you for a long time. This is a real speciality of the market. This is called Olivia Scolane. Buongiorno. Buongiorno a voi. And this is Migliore. Buongiorno. Ciao. Buongiorno. Olivia. Buongiorno. Mio figlio. And this is his son. And his father used to do this. And his father, his father used oh, to do okay. this. So oh, they travel all over the region to make this delicacy. To make Olivia Scolane, the Migliore stuffs the olives with meat, and his son Augusto deep fried them in the breadcrumbs to create this simple but richly flavored snack. The most important thing is to use the right type of olives. Have so I tasted these olives sometimes no. stuffed with peppers? No, or they're not no, used, no, they're no, only no, used no. for this. Yes. <laughs> the olives, come si chiama? La, la tenera scolana. Tenera tenera scolana. Because you have to taste these olives because they taste different. What taste does it, it mean, tenera? Tenera, tender. A, a tenera tenera e croccante. And because it's tender and very crispy in the same time, and it has a fantastic flavor. So these olives really makes the difference, you know? That's sweet, that. that's sweet, that's sweet. That's yes, sweet, completely. Yes. I'm gonna show you how to make one. I cut the tip and then I follow it, just go around without breaking until you make a spiral out of it. Brilliant. So we got the spiral. So you got kind of an S-shaped yeah. curl of olives. And then I got a little bit of the stuffing. Fatto col manzo, maiale, fatto a tocchetti. Beef. Beef and pork, all cut in little pieces and cooked like a ragu. I put it here. And then we rebuild the olives around it. So you're kind of replacing the yeah. olive stone? Yeah. Then it goes into the flour and then in the egg. And from the eggs onto the breadcrumbs. Remember, the frito, the fried, is always something for Sunday. It was something you have to be a rich occasion to have Fritto. Is that because traditionally it was quite a luxurious thing to do? Sì, è una cosa lussuosa avere il fritto. Quando una persona va al matrimonio e torna a casa, il parente chiede, era bella la sposa? Dice sì, le olive erano buone? Do you think they ask you when you come back from ready? Was the, was the bride... bride beautiful? Yes. Uh, what about the olives? <laughs> <laughs> 
Guarda quanti ho! È la verità, eh? Ci credo, I believe you, I believe you. Look at that. Yeah, best aspect. Oh, you can put it in there. Could you just wait a second? No, no, eat them straight away. Nice and hot, Andrew. Sempre così. Be careful, thank you. Thank you. You tell me the truth. Ecco, ecco. Is it delicious or what? It's unbelievable. Yes. Can you imagine these? It's buonissimo. It's beautiful. What's surprising about them is how delicate the taste mm. is. You've got this sort of sweetness in the olives, and then you've got this um, saltiness. The saltiness. I remember I went to a wedding. Well, I must have been 18 or something like that. I had these. I'll tell you what, it's the first time I had them. I just went on and on and on. I never had anything else to eat than <laughs> olive arts colada. I couldn't, when I discovered them, they were like, you know, oh my God, this is incredible. Oh, I can see why. Oh, they're very much. Yeah, grazie mille. Grazie a voi. E mi raccomando, eh. Grazie. Tenete grazie, duro. Grazie. 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 Buon lavoro. Grazie, arrivederci. Grazie. grazie. Take one. The olives are mouth-watering, but today's main course is a rather different kind of dish. I'm taking Giorgio to see perhaps Urbino's greatest treasure, the vast palace of the man who put this town on the map. Scholar, connoisseur, commander of a private army, he was one of the driving forces behind the Italian Renaissance. So Urbino, as we see it now, is very much the creation of one man, and he's signed the city. Everywhere you look, you see his initials, Feidux, Federico da Montefeltro, Duke of Urbino. He wasn't afraid to show off. Oh, no. He ruled this place. He was the tyrant of the town, a benevolent tyrant, or so he liked to think. Federico was obsessed by the classical past, and this beautiful inscription tells us all about him. He won every battle in which he fought. He led his troops into action six times. But through war, he brought peace. He was victorious. This inscription is a masterpiece of early Renaissance typography. Absolutely beautiful writing. Very modern in a way, isn't it? Very, very, very sharp and clear and rational. I love the Q. The Q is the same as the O, but it's got this really long tail. I love these punctuation points between the words. There's this sort of little leaf. He loved really fine stone carving. This palace is his domain. It's all about him. Federigo was a warrior, but with an inquiring mind. He'd had a classical education. He read Latin military texts, and he studied rhetoric so he could persuade his enemies to surrender without even fighting and he'd still get paid. Knowledge for Federigo was power. Everything in this palace is calculated to his specifications, mm. even the shallowness of these steps. Do you notice how easy they are to walk up? Yes. That's because he said to his architect, if I get to the top of my stairs and I've broken into a sweat, you've done a bad job. The palace was heavily looted in the years after Federigo's death, and now it's eerily empty. But from the few things that remain, you can still piece together a portrait of Federigo himself, a true Renaissance man. They have kept this, which is a very rare portrait of Federigo himself, mm. with his son in his library. I like the idea that instead of being on a horse like that, he's there with a book in his hand. Knowledge was as important to him as courage. I think the expression is incredible. Look, he's got all these lines over his head, like that. Like, he's really, like, thinking heavily. Almost like say, I'm strong, I'm powerful, but I also have knowledge. He's always painted from this side, because when he was young, he was passionately in love with this woman, and he jousted in her colours. And one day, his opponent's lance went through his visor, and completely removed Federigo's eye. Mm. So he was blind in one eye on the other side and apparently had a very disfiguring scar. But do you notice that he has no bridge to his nose? A gap in there. There's a gap. It? Now, some people think that's because when the lance entered the visor of his helmet, it 
removed part of his nose as well as his eye. Mm. But there's another theory which I really like, according to which Federigo actually asked his surgeon, his court surgeon, to remove the bridge of his nose. So that he could see with the so only eyes could, in the air. Exactly, because he, he was a great student of optics. He commissioned the first great Renaissance treatise on perspective, and it's all about what the single eye can see. Over here, there's a really good example or proof of, of Federigo's interest in the science of vision, the science of optics. This, this is called the ideal city, and it's a perfectly perspectively drawn and painted depiction of, I think, the kind of city that Federigo wanted to turn Urbino into. This was all absolutely brand new, this Renaissance ability to create a perspectively perfect depiction, mathematically receding through space, of an architectural vision. You know, Andrew, I like to think that uh, like somebody 600 years ago just comes here and saw these, and they thought, oh, wow, this is the future. This would have seemed absolutely futuristic. Federigo and his artists saw themselves as visionaries. They were visionaries. Mm -hmm. The new Renaissance ideas that lie behind a picture like this have very much shaped our world. Definitely. I mean, if you think of a city like Paris, mm. which is of with its huge wide avenues, very carefully planned Porticos. central buildings like the Théâtre de Paris, it's absolutely that notion. It's about doing away with the medieval labyrinth mm -hmm. of old towns. It's very beautiful and very peaceful, and there's nobody there. There's only live things. Two little pigeons there. They've crept unnoticed, mm. or they've flown unnoticed into the ideal city. All the door open. The window are open as well. It's quite eerie. It's like a sort of Marie Celeste city. Federigo's ideal cities had a huge influence on the public spaces of the modern world. But he was actually a very private man. And behind this empty enthronement hall is his personal study, a place of retreat, which is one of my favorite rooms in the whole world. In this great, huge palace with its vast, echoing halls, the best room of all is the smallest. This is... Federigo's private studiolo, his study. Wow. Still with its original 15th century wood panelled walls. Every inch decorated with this tremendously intricate, absolutely beautiful inlaid wood. Designed and created by the very finest artists of the early Renaissance. Botticelli designed this figure of one of the three Graysons. Piero della Francesca possibly designed this landscape. Everywhere you look, it's just a feast for the eyes. You see that trapezoidal circle? Right. Almost impossible to create the image of that in perspective if you're painting, let alone to do it in inlaid wood. Isn't it something? I mean, the, the sheer level of optical trickery and illusionism in oh. these panels. I mean, this is the absolute pinnacle of the art form of Intarsia. It's all different type of wood, no? Different types of wood to create different kind of colors. And sometimes, they would burn the wood oh, to create those shadows, effect. that sense of the shadow, and then they would polish it so that the char would sort of stay fixed. Look at the armour. It looks like he's shining. It's as if he's hung up his armour in that cupboard and you've got the trompe l'oeil curtains that enable us to see it. How can you make wood shining? <laughs> the skill of that, the spur dangling over the edge, I think he planned the room as carefully as a military campaign. Definitely. Always in the art created for Federigo and his palace, you got the two symbols together. I am a warrior, but I am also a man of learning. There's the books. 
in a sense, the whole studiolo is kind of a room designed to reflect a man's brain, a man's spirit, a man's sense of who he was. Never seen anything like that. There isn't really anything else like it in the world. The studiolo was such a feast for the eyes that now we need a hearty Lamarca feast for our palates. I'm going to make something that Federico probably ate himself, and it's one of my favorite dishes from the region, if not all Italy. The classic Lamarca dish of coniglio and porchetta, rabbit in the style of roast pork. Buongiorno. 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 Cosa Beh, voleva? Beh, noi dobbiamo cucinare il coniglio in porchetta. Oh. Allora. Abbiamo un bel coniglio grande. Questo è molto grande. Perfetto. Speciale. Il più grande. Wow. Why does she leave the head on the rabbit? Well, the head is the most important thing. First of all, because you know then it's a rabbit and not a cat, first. <laughs> Second, because you can tell the age of the rabbit from the size of his teeth. You don't want the rabbit that is too old. You want to tell maximum is eight months old, nine months old. So you can tell. So the, the, the head of the rabbit is like a sell-by date in that the form is of, that, that is form exactly, of the head. That is exactly what it is. Look at the array of meat and how beautiful and well kept. You don't only just buy meat, you buy the knowledge of the person. If you decide to buy that piece of meat, it'll tell you how to cook it. 19.15. Prego. Grazie. And the smile as well. Look at the beautiful smile. <laughs> <laughs> Buona giornata. Grazie. Arrivederci, grazie. grazie. Molto buono, grazie. With our rabbit, we're heading down the valley below Urbino. We'll be cooking at an historic Lamarque Antin Lodge. It's the very house where Torquato Tasso, the great 16th century poet, wrote beautiful verses in homage to the landscapes of Lamarque. Everywhere you go in this part of Italy, you seem to touch a little piece of history. So, Andrew, this recipe fascinated me from the first time I had it. My granddad used to actually, you know, raise rabbit. And my grandmother used to be like uh, cooking this rabbit. And, you know, it's almost like my signature dish. One of the main ingredients, and obviously, you know, in the middle of Italy, is going to be this white fennel. It's lovely. Smell that. It's fantastic, isn't it? So you're creating a kind of broth? That's right. Okay, I'm going to put that in cold water with a two, two or three cloves of garlic and close the whole thing and put it up to boil. And this is going to be my stop. I think we need to cook the rabbit because it, it's staring at me, Giorgio. Hold on a second. The next step is to prepare the rabbit. I'm going to cut it in half for you so that you can eat the actual... The meat must be really pink and beautiful. The fat must be really white. The lady in the yeah. bushes said leave the bones. Leave the bones in. Some people take all the bones off. I feel that if you leave the bones in it, it's so much better. I'm ready with that. Okay, now I'm gonna make the stuffing. I'm gonna chop the liver. The only problem with houses like these is then they also have historical uh, <laughs> chopping boards, <laughs> which are never straight. Along with the liver, I add one fresh sausage, raw pancetta, and a good dollop of lard. Putting all this stuffing in it will make it really juicy and really cook perfectly. I often think we don't eat enough rabbits. No. Yeah, the bad publicity because the kids look at them like a pet. The rabbit has become these things and talk to us. I blame Richard Adams, Watership Down. <laughs> I mean, I'll tell you what, me and my brother grow up and we were, when we were little, we'd go with my granddad and we'd choose the one, the rabbit, to kill. I think then he teach us to appreciate that it wasn't just something that arrived from a shop in a packet. One of the things that the lady this morning in the shop told me, as you start in it, just put a little bit of the pancetta on top of it. Like, when it starts to color, I will add some of the stock to keep it moist and I will cover it and cook it in the oven. Yeah. Okay? 
Mm. So are you ready to wait two hours now? Yeah, I'm ready to wait. Okay. Two hours. I'm actually ready to eat it now, but if two hours is necessary, two hours is necessary. As the rabbit cooks, we'll take a passeggiata through the lush ground of the Antin Lodge. When people talk about central Italy, they often really mean Tuscany. There's so much more to discover in the heart of Italy. This undulating landscape on the eastern side of the Apennines is truly breathtaking. After basting the rabbit with wild fennel broth, we are ready to eat our feast. Il coniglio in porchetta, Andrew. Looking good. Whoa! <coughs> what a wonderful, hearty plate of food. Eh, allora. Bello. Hey, yo. That looks good. Hey, wait a minute. Oh, I've got some gravy as well. Yeah. Looks rich, doesn't it? So, what do you recommend that I take a little bit of rabbit? A little bit of the stuffing. Dip it round in the gravy. That's right. <laughs> really good. Really good. Mmm. What are you got? Is it tender? Mmm. Oh, it's completely tender. It's not dried. I can see how it might be dry, but it isn't. Mm. Perfect. This was right. Mmm. One of my favorite recipes. The meat it's closest to that I'm familiar with would have to be chicken, I suppose. Yes, sir. But it's got a lovely, delicate taste. Yeah, unbelievable. The stuffing with the liver gives you that little kick, you know. Mm. It's a great flavour there. So what makes this a marquigiana dish? Once upon a time, every household will have 10, 20 rabbits, then they just give all the scrapes of the vegetable and something like that, and that's how they just got their protein through the year. I can't believe that from this <laughs> small rabbit, this huge plate of food emerges, but that's very marquigiana, maybe. You know, they make a, a lot out of a little. Mm. Like Urbino, little town, but it produces Raphael, Bramante, the architect of St. Peter's. I think this is a place that really punches above its weight. It's a small place, but it produced so many great figures. Even in modernity, you know? You know who come from market? Valentino Rossi, the greatest motorbike driver in the entire world. <laughs> I think I just heard him driving past. <laughs> So far, we see the sunny, gentle side of Le Marque. Now I want to show Andrew the darker side of the region and begin our descent to the center of the earth. There, we can get a different perspective of what makes Le Marque so special. I've never been to this part of Le Marque, Giorgio. When people think about Italy, and especially, you know, like not northern Italy with the Alps, they always think about like these sort of like beaches and, <laughs> and sea, don't they? They never think about the Apennine. The Apennine, they really are big mountain. They're really steep. And they're they're like the geologically, sort of... they're very interesting as well. Are they like the spine of Italy? That's right. So where are you taking me? I'm going to take you to Frassassi. There's a little surprise for you here. They must have a lot of rock falls because there's Absolutely. they've sort of bound the mountain in wire caging. Very porous rocks that allow water to come through. And this is a road that is cut through next to the river. Mm. It's an incredible place. Mm. Here we are. We're in the middle of nowhere. It's a long tunnel. Yes, you're going to be absolutely gobsmacked when you see this. L'Abisso di Ancona, Andrew. Here we are. Look at the magnificence of this. That is something. That is incredible, isn't it's it? It's so big. It's enormous. The Abisso di Ancona, or Ancona Abyss, lies deep beneath the Frassassi Gorge. Discovered by chance in 1971, the abyss is one of the largest underground caves in the world, at 240 meters high. It's a place that takes us back to a world before history. These stalagmites took more than 100,000 years, drip by drip, 
to grow to over 60 foot high, as tall as Nelson's column. You show me some massive buildings and things like that. Apparently it's as big as the Cathedral of Milan. A and cathedral you, made by nature. That's right. Well, I want to take a closer look at some of these stalagmites and They're stalactites. They're beautiful, aren't they? They really are. Incredible. I don't think I've ever seen such wonderful ones. It's really all inspiring to be down here looking up. You can see why the surrealists called these cave formations petrified forests. <laughs> yes, they look like trees, don't they? They look like so many different things. That, sort of, that could be made of candle wax. That one reminds me of um, a Chinese pagoda, maybe at Kew Gardens or somewhere. It's fantastic. Mm -hmm. And have you seen up there? There's a shape that looks almost like sort of tripe or something like that. You know, Andrew, this is a very humbling experience to be inside here. Time it really is relative, isn't it, when you look at something like that? There's someone coming down now. Yes, look, that is the actual way in, in which the actual cave was discovered. That's the that upside down, the like that. Unbelievable, no? They found this hole, apparently, and there was the sides of a football, and some really cold air was coming out. They dropped a stone, and they thought that like, there was 100 metres, but then it turned out to be 200 metres high. Oh! Imagine if your shells were... <laughs> you From know there. when you hear that. You must have thought this I'll... is a big cave. I did find something incredible, yeah. Huh. yeah. Like discovering a new planet if you're an astronomer. Definitely. Must have been such an exhilarating moment. Look at the shadow of him. You really are in the belly of the Apennine. So brilliant, this mountain. It is so beautiful from the outside to have hide such a secret for such a long time. We haven't crossed the Apennines so much as gone under them. And now we've emerged on the other side, we're in Umbria. Without a coastline, Umbria is often called the green art of Italy. A landscape of fertile plains dotted with hilltop towns. Umbria has a long tradition of men working with nature to create some of the best produce in Italy. And some of the best paintings in Italy too which is what we're just about to see. Yeah, it's so nice to see this low land. We are right at the bottom of the valley, and each of the villages is just up at the top, isn't it? We're on our way to Spello, which I don't think very many people visit, but it contains, for me, one of the great series of fresco paintings of the Renaissance by an artist called Pintoricchio, the little painter. Fantastic. And there, the there it is now. During the Renaissance, powerful local families fought for control of Umbria's fertile land. You can still feel that rather troubled past, if you know where to look. The Baglioni family once controlled Spello, and in 1500, they asked Pinturicchio to paint the chapel of the Santa Maria Maggiore Church and demonstrate to the world, through their art, the grip they had on the area. It's one of the great things of the Renaissance, but very few people know about it. Very few people come and see these paintings. They've recently been restored. The colors are singing. Look at the gold of the halos, the green of the grass, the blue of the sky. It's just stunning. There are three frescoes, each telling a different story from the early life of Christ. To bring biblical legend home to his audience, Pinturicchio set the action not in the Holy Land, but on Umbrian soil. Painting less than 50 years after the death of Federigo de Montefeltro, Pinturicchio clearly knew all about the tricks of perspective developed in Urbino. This scene of the young Christ teaching his elders is like Federigo's ideal city, except now it's full of people. But Pinturicchio wasn't just a follower, he was an innovator in his own right. 
with his own unique sense of colour, grace and heavenly harmony. This is the Annunciation. Wow. OK, look, look at that. Ah, look at the ray of light coming down to her uh, with the dove. Oh, yeah. Look, the dove has got this... Like she's whistling, really, to the, to the Madonna. That's God impregnating the Virgin Mary. And she's going, oh, I can feel it. The spirit of the Lord moves within me. And at the same time, Gabriel, with the lily, symbol of the Virgin's purity, the white lily. That might be one of the most beautiful Archangel Gabriels in the world. Guys, so delicate and so androgynous and beautiful. Look at that. Look at the wings. <gasps> Look at the color on that. Like a peacock wings. He's a feast for the eyes. Really a feast. It's just incredible. And look, here is the man. Pinturicchio himself. Pinturicchio was so proud of this chapel, of the sequence of frescoes, that he included his own self-portrait in a gold frame. Look at the choir of angels. Angels are beautiful. Just beautiful. If you ever want to explain to anybody what is the heavenly choir, bring them here. That's it. That entire group, with all its swirling drapery, its wonderful symphony of colours, all done in a single day of painting. That's eight hours, the time it takes to plaster to dry. Just doesn't get better than that. I think the message of the painting is to say, Jesus Christ has been born again here in Umbria. The scene of the nativity is all set in the local landscape. Mm. And these are probably portraits of the local peasantry. Although they look so peaceful, so calm, you would imagine no violence ever takes place in this world. The context for these paintings being commissioned was one of extreme violence and conflict. I have those ones which have got swords, so they must be like, I don't know, were warriors? There's a fight taking place. This is the Baglioni Chapel. The Baglioni was a local family, very rich, very powerful, but they'd just gone through a period of horrible vendetta. Mm. Grifonetto Baglioni mm. had actually been to the wedding of his cousin Astore to La Vigna Colonna and had used it, because everyone was together, he'd used it to kill the entire family and try to seize control of the region. He'd been defeated by this man, Troilo, who commissioned these beautiful paintings from Pintoricchio to celebrate and reaffirm the Baglioni family's grip on this territory. So behind these paintings, there's a lot of blood. In fact, they called the marriage, where Grifonetto killed all the guests, they called it the marriage of blood. It seems to happen ever again and again in Italy in so many families, isn't it? Because you have this sort of family control over an area, you know, the Medici controlling Florence, the Sforza controlling Milan, the Baglioni controlling this part of Umbria. But Troilo, he looks like a pretty tough character. It does, doesn't it? What's that? That's somebody hanging up there, is it? That is Pinturicchio's way of conveying the murders are in the past, the blood wedding has been, Grifonetto has been executed, justice has been done, order has been restored. From the skilled artist of Spello to the skilled artisan of the Valley of Norcia. For centuries, people from this valley have been known as master pig butcher and makers of delicious pork sausages and salamis. Butcher in Italy are still sometimes even called Norcino, or the person from Norcia. So where are you taking me? I'm gonna take you to see a real Norcino. The guys who just breed the animal, kills them, and turn them into sausages and things like that, and have a real traditional one. So yeah. this, is, this is the real deal? This is the real deal, no? Fantastic place, the fields and the... Well, this is where they grow the lentils that they, they use as a feed for the animal. It's beautiful, this Valle de Lorcha. It looks really fertile. I love the colour of the earth. 
I think they've just ploughed the fields. I can't live here without getting some local sausages. And they are the ingredients of the traditional Umbrian recipe I want to make. Fresh pork sausages with lentils. People have farmed pigs in this majestic valley for thousands of years. And this farm is one of only a few in Italy trying to reintroduce an ancient breed of Umbrian pigs. And you can't even imagine how excited I am to see these pigs. <laughs> Love them. Look at them. They're just so beautiful. This is maiale nero cintato. So the black Dino. belted pig of From North. North. So. As you can see, the pig is black and he has this belt and goes around the front legs. So that's la cinta. Cinta is this, the belt. So our belt. They look more to me like, um, almost like a cross between a domesticated pig and a wild boar. They, have well, they are closer to the wild boar than, you know, those completely northern European shades of pink pig that we are used to see. And what makes them so special? Why are they so desirable to, to the Norcino pig butchers? You tell me why they're so desirable when you taste it. <laughs> That's when you know. Very simple. It. Yeah. <laughs> but the idea of this is that, you know, the animal is reared in a very human way. The animal is very happy. It's fed lentils, which are the byproduct of those lands that you have got here. Big ones are on pens and they are opened up on the wood. So they are half woods and half sort of, you know, air, open area. Like so that. they'll eat acorns and nuts and maybe berries even? Berries. That gives you fantastic flavor to the meat, you know. Plus the animals moving around. I think what it is is just this relation between this meat and this land. And this is like, you know, I wouldn't mind being a pig if I had to grow up here. On you? <laughs> yeah, you're going to be a pig. This is a good place to be. It's um, what would what would pig heaven be called? Porkadice, Pigtopia. <laughs> Pigtopia, I love that. Well, this is kind of Pigtopia. Pigtopia. Next to the farm is the family butcher store. The couple who runs it are known locally as Litapi, or the little cooks, as they're both so short. Mr. Mario is a Norcino and he's gonna make some sausage for us. And he's here with his wife, look. By the way, these people have been married for 48 years. So making sausage is something that could save your marriage. Mario and Gabriella Salvatori makes fresh sausages which people drive from all over Italy to buy. The only ingredients are pork from their farm, salt, pepper, and for every 20 kilo of meat, one clove of garlic as well as their love and pride. They use prime pieces of the pork. Look at the mixture, 100% of fresh meat. This operation usually is always made by machine. This is the beginning, when we started this work, it was this one. When they start, when they, when, when they start, when they really start to do that by themselves, when they start to do that by themselves, when they run their business, this, this is how they would do it. Now a lot of the people do this by machine, but look now, what we're going to witness now is incredible. And what's the sausage skin made from? From the intestine of the pig. This looks very easy. Doesn't look very easy. Look very easy, but there is so much rhythm and strength. It almost looks like an umbilical cord. I love this machine. The machine is fabulous, isn't it? Look, she's, she's, just doing, it she's just doing that. But there's a kind of surgical precision about the whole process. Unbelievable. And in fact, there is a connection between this part of Italy and surgery, because the skills of the pork butcher were then transplanted, and the, the first surgeons came from here. And there was That's this right. man called Cesare Scacchi, uh, who actually went to the court of Queen Elizabeth in 1588, the year of the Armada. Yes, I think that their precision and their capacity to cut it down and go through muscle and understanding fibres and understanding what yeah. was... It, it, it was then translated into humans. Yeah, I mean, Elizabeth I, uh, had a cataract in her eye, and that's why she asked. <laughs> so they man. got a guy from Earth to from here, because oh, they knew how to use it. Unbelievable. A oh, fantastic. The manuality is incredible. How many are we going to buy, Andrew? Um, well, I would say maybe like about that many for me. 
<laughs> no, I'm only kidding. I, I don't know. I don't know. They're, I imagine they're very I rich. I think to be on the safe side, we buy ten of them. Five for you, five for me. That sounds plenty. Yeah. Uh, do you think we should buy some? Grazie. Un bacio. Siete uno spettacolo. Grazie. Grazie. Arrivederci. We got our sausages, and to get our lentils, we need to climb up into the mountains and the highest village of the Apennine. The town of Castelluccio, 4,500 feet above sea level and home to some of the best lentils in the world. And as we're driving up, the mists suddenly clear and we're given another vision of celestial beauty. This time, it's not in a painting. I thought you said there was no sea in Umbria. <laughs> <laughs> this is so, so beautiful. God, I'm speechless, Andrew. Something, isn't it? I mean, we have drove all through that. <laughs> and I had no hope that we were going to see the sun today. I really I know. didn't. I know. And look at these. You really feel like you're in the Apennines here. I mean, it's, well, we're kind of above everything. So our man who makes the sausages, he's somewhere down there beneath the sea of fog. We're lucky today, though, aren't we? I mean, to have this view, to actually rise above the cloud. The clouds sort of forms during the night until the heat is kind of like melting them off. So the last one would be like the one who's at the bottom of the valley. It's a beautiful, beautiful day. It is. And then uh, Umbria, Umbria. The whole of this road's like a wonderful roller coaster through the natural landscape of Umbria. And our destination, this fertile valley. Here, I'm discovering for the first time in my life the Piano Grande of Castelluccio, the Great Plain of Castelluccio. Wow, look at that. This is... That is something. There's nothing and to that's all. all lentils. It's very special. That is Castelluccio. Like a painting, it's beautiful. Unbelievable. It's really unusual to find a, a, a lovely city like that which is completely in a valley without any other buildings. And this is, look at this straight road. You can see that the Roman have been here, but, whoa! The road to Castelluccio takes you through what today is a national park. The lentils grown here are known throughout Italy as Castelluccio Lento for their unique flavor that comes from this majestic land in the clouds. I'm excited to prepare this dish in the very town that gives the lentils their name. Look how beautiful they are, they're so special. Look, they haven't got even the same color. What I love is this beautiful pinky, brown, green. I mean, all the colors are there. To cook the lentils, I chop some celery add a few cloves of garlic, and just cover them with fresh mountain water. No stock tubes, no soaking. A simple recipe built on centuries of Umbrian skills and tradition. We're gonna have to cook the sausages. How many you want? Well, what about three for you, three for me, and one in case somebody wants some more? Mm. I love them, the fact that they're not exactly the same size. You know? Yeah. I'm ready, I'm putting the sausages in. Gonna get the color, you know, leaving some nice flavor in there. Straight from the from the land to the table. Absolutely, this is really peasant cookie at its best. Yeah. <laughs> Just the mud, you know, the beautiful pig that they have been fed with the leftover of those lentils. Lentils. It's lovely cooking the meal that comes from the land directly above the land. It's a great view from here. I'm going to get them out. They're not cooked yet. They're still a bit rare. Get the onions, Andrew. Put them in there. Just straight in. Yeah, in. in there. Perfect. And... and chop them very fine. You see, it melts straight away. This is the passata. 
homemade one. Okay, here we are. So you've got gold onions and red tomato sauce. But you can see already that that's going to taste good. The tomato sauce is boiling. Sausages, so the sausages in. are in. I am proud of this recipe because we have managed to produce it with the minimum of the ingredients. Like the real people here will produce it. I mean, you could have, can have tons of things. You can have rosemary, sage, carrot, celery. You can have anything, you know. I don't think he's going to make it better. No, I, I agree think with you. this is yeah. the essential. Do you want to taste it? <laughs> <laughs> it's good flavour. Almost like a nut. Uh -huh. No, yeah, it's a really nice nutty flavour. Scoop them out and put them in it. A tiny little bit of this beautiful Umbrian olive oil. And we are ready. OK, here you are. So it's a one-pot meal. Well, that's not good enough. It's a one-pot masterpiece. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a masterpiece from this land. Yeah. Not from the cook. This is not the cook. You step back. This is the land. This is the land that's stuck to you, not the chef. Well, this is a very you see, I think bit. it takes a really good cook to say that. Where are we going to eat here? Have well, you got any... a, let's just eat outside okay. and, and take in the view. Yeah, let's do that. Andrew, guarda. Guarda in che posto ti ho portato. Ah, not bad, eh? Siediti. Are you ready to taste Umbria? <laughs> yeah, I am. Ah, yeah. Give me some Umbria. You've got to prepare yourself. Bello. Can I have a bit of lentils? Is that enough? I think to be beginning with, yeah. Here we go. Look at that. Lentils. Mm. Oh, those sausages, fantastic. Sometimes less is much better. Simplicity delivers a better taste. Yeah, well, what I love about this recipe is it doesn't confuse your mind. No. You're not thinking, oh, where's that? Oh, what's, ooh, ooh, what's that? Why is that there? No, you just got the, the beautiful meat of the perfectly raised pig, the wonderful taste of the lentils, the tomato sauce, and a kiss of garlic. Perfect. That's yes, right. The lentils really brings it up almost, isn't it? What I really like is the way that the sausage has very little fat. It doesn't taste greasy in any way. The moisture comes from the lentil, not from the, not from the fat. It tastes like it's really good for you. Mm. I think what is also amazing is that really these are flavours that they really are so representative of Umbria and, you know, this, this area and Castelluccio and Norcia. How nice is it to eat it here? Wow. <laughs> so that's where the lentils came from. All and, around. Because where... they don't only use the flat. You, they use also the side. You can see the agricultural bit goes really right up as well. So everything on our plate is from within 10 kilometres. Yeah. Amazing. It's almost like a divine gift. Then this concentration of goodness will come to your plates. And we better eat quickly because the storms are coming across. It doesn't rhyme, but it's true. The rain in Umbria falls mostly on the lentils. <laughs> <laughs> Oh. Umbria is an amazing patchwork of valleys, each hiding his own treasures. The most famous town in the region is the birthplace of St. Francis, Assisi. Today, this holy town is full of day trippers and pilgrims. But we're not stopping at Assisi. We're heading off to a little town off the beaten track called Montefalco. Here, you can get up close to the life of St. Francis in some beautiful frescoes painted by a young Renaissance master.
I like this kind of place. Little church, little town, all on our own with some frescoes painted by Benozzo Gozzoli. This was his first work as a maestro in his own right in the early 1450s. But this is his debut. These are his first ambitious paintings. And here in Umbria, of course, the subject is the life of Francis. Francis of Assisi. And here is the birth. Gozzoli has set it in his own time. And because Francis was rich, he has him being born in a beautiful, luxurious 15th century palazzo. I have not Venetian blind yet. You know, they are like blind but with holes in it. It's brilliant. That nail hanging out yeah. between the windows. I hadn't seen the nail. And that, that actually becomes a device in painting. You know, when a painter wants to show off that he can paint the shadows, he does this trompe l'oeil nail. What I love about these is they're almost like um, little photographs of 15th century life. This type of fresco cycle, it's very much the forerunner of cinema, cartoons, our way of telling stories, mm. one image after another. And here, Jesus Christ came to St. Francis in a dream and showed him a vision of the heavenly city. You can imagine Gotsley scratching his head and thinking, well, what should, oh, the, heaven, what should like? the heavenly city look like? Where, what's the most fantastic building that I can think of? Where is Gotsley from? He's from Florence. And so what's he depicted? the Palazzo Signoria, the main building of Florence, with all of the Christian flags flying from it. Francis gets the dream wrong, and he thinks he's been called, actually, to go on a crusade. In fact, he's been called by God to rebuild his church, to remake the heavenly city on mm, earth. Mm, mm, mm. And for me, this is the most dramatic scene yeah. in the whole chapel. Beautiful painting of the early Renaissance city. But what's happening here is that St. Francis has renounced his worldly possessions. Right. His father was in the textile trade and was very rich. And Francis has given away all his clothes, given away all his money. His father, furious, is coming with all the things that Francis has rejected, all the beautiful textiles and clothes, and he's about to beat him with his belt. And look, there are two children of the family there. They've got stones that they were ready to throw at Francis. So the family is about to get him, and who comes to his rescue? It's the Bishop of Assisi. I find it slightly sinister because Gotzoli's painting 220 years after Francis's death, and this is a time when the church very much wants to make Francis its own, when in fact, in his own time, Francis had been revolutionary yes. and a lot of friction yes. with the church, because yes. he felt the church was losing touch with the ordinary people, and he was very critical of the rich bishops living luxuriously, and That's right. the monks in their monasteries eating their fill while the poor people went without food. Here we've got, I think it's a sort of strange, paradoxical image. He's thrown away his rich clothing, and here the bishop is wrapping him in his cope, which is richly embroidered, making more part of the church than he really was. Also, the father has a really a very aggressive stand, isn't he? And the face, and he's absolutely brilliant with faces, I think. And the hairstyle, absolutely exceptional. He's the master of the golden ringlet. I mean, you're dead right about the faces. Every single detail of those faces is really carefully painted. And we know that the time allotted for these paintings was, you know, you'd expect maybe a year. Mm. Gotsoli took two years to paint these pictures. Mm. And in fact, he got so late that his patrons in Florence began to get impatient. They were like, where are you, man? Where are you? Where are you? But also, come back. Yeah. And there's a wonderful detail over here. It's a sort of footnote to the experience of looking at the frescoes. This is a fantastic thing. This is a letter from Benozzo to a friend in Florence. It's, I suppose, the 15th century equivalent of a hastily dashed off email. And he's writing in 1452 to say, I'm really sorry, I know I said I'd come to see you, I know I'd come to visit, I think there's probably a commission involved, but I can't because I'm still stuck here in Montefalco painting my frescoes.
so ancient and so modern. Still, we still write like that to people, don't we? Yeah, Sometimes, yeah, yeah. You know, when, we want, when we want to be really proper, we do write something like that, don't yeah, we? Yeah. On the paper with your name on it and the dates. Incredible. <laughs> Beautiful thing. Yeah. Well, it took him two years to paint these frescoes. Mm. So this poor chap was obviously kept waiting quite some time. And Yamo. Andrew has shown me the Renaissance masterpieces of Umbria. We are at the end of our journey, and we cannot leave this beautiful region without me showing him what I think is Umbria's greatest natural masterpiece. A spectacle forged by human hands and the power of nature. The waterfall of Marmore. La Cascata delle Marmore. Fantastic, eh? And you know that? That's man-made by the Roman. Amazing. The waterfall is said to be the highest man-made waterfall in the world. At 165 meter high, it was created by an entire Roman legion diverting a river to get rid of malaria. I love this cloud of mist. During the 19th century and the 18th century, English yeah. romantics That's made right. this. This became one of the places that the Grand Tour... You know, Byron the, used to come here. He said, horribly beautiful. Horribly beautiful. Horribly beautiful. This was the epitome of the sublime, something in nature that makes you feel scared. The waterfall today is regulated by a dam and only runs at half the power it did when Byron saw it. Around one million litres of water pour through the waterfall every minute, creating its own torrent of air. Come on. It's a powerful symbol of Umbria itself, a place where man has worked with the forces of nature for thousands of years and continues to do so a tradition flowing from the past on into the future. So I think we've traveled thousands of kilometers through the Marche and Umbria, huge territory. Beautiful territory. Uh, beautiful. I'm trying to think what my favorite things have been. I, I loved the Cornelio in Borgheta that you made, the rabbit, that was just so delicious. I also love those Pinturicchio paintings. They were beautiful. And just restored like that, they were absolutely live and vibrant, so nice. But the thing that shocked me more, Andrew, was that alto piano di Castelluccio. That was like being in another world. I never knew that in Italy there was a place like that. It was so beautiful. It and was. It was like being on top of the world. But now, now it's onwards and upwards because we're on our way to the Veneto. But not the familiar Veneto of Venezia, because we're not even going to go to Venice, right? No Venice at all. We're going to go to Padova, we're going to go to Vicenza, and then the best, Andrew, is going to be that we're going to go right up, right up to the Dolomites, which are these rocks that look back to Italy, and you're not going to believe what you're going to see, I'm telling you. Andiamo! <laughs> Location, location, location for QI next tonight on BBC Two. Jason Manford and Johnny Vegas are on the guest list in just a moment.